welcome to webinar number 28. You are more than welcome to join us. Um, hopefully you can see us. You should be able to see a few more people than usual on screen tonight. And um, we have an absolutely jam-packed webinar with lots of guests, our extended team, and we are coming to you from all over the UK tonight. So I'm going to look in the chat and see where you lovely people are from. So we've got, wow, that went fast, 160 people. So tell us where you are in the world, um, what you're doing at the moment. I know the obvious answer is watching this webinar, but you know what you're doing work-wise. Are you studying? Are you working? Are you a social worker? Um, what your specialism is and then when we when we chat in the chat later we'll be able to kind of understand who everybody is so let's have a look we have got Birmingham Derbyshire Teesside I'm just looking to see when we go international because it's we kind of challenge each other every week to see who can spot the first international person get started because tonight is the first uh, panel session of the year and you know if you've been to our webinars you know that when we have a panel webinar there's a lot to fit in we have got some fabulous guests and we want to make sure that everybody has the time that they need for this really important topic tonight um but before we get started we have to mention something this week um, that is very sad um but we can't really have a webinar about men in social work without talking about a man who is very close to our hearts actually um my very good friend and colleague and i'm hoping that i will um manage to get through what we need to say now but my very good friend and colleague um yusuf mccormack who joined us in webinar seven the art of analysis yusuf was a marvelously kind generous wonderful man who gave a lot to social work um, Yusuf grew up in the care system and went on to become a foster carer and an adopter. Um, unfortunately, on Friday, um, Yusuf died um, of COVID and uh, we uh, were very shocked. Um, I had spoken to Yusuf just a few days before and um, we, can't, um, we can't let his passing go without remembering him and um, dedicating tonight's webinar to him really. Um, it was due to join us again for our webinar on love in social work which was very fitting because um, as a friend and a colleague I loved uh, Yusuf and the artwork that is there um, was something that uh, he did for World Social Work Day last year, that little button that he sent, putting the love into social work with an S on for uh, my name. Uh, so there's a few things on there that are gifts that uh, Yusuf sent to all of us. And that photograph of Yusuf at the Care Experienced Conference, um, he was a leader of the Care Experienced community. And um, he never did what he did for... Um, any praise or to further his own name he did what he did for children and the future of the social care service so um he called for us to be the difference not to make a difference but to be the difference and um Yusuf was the difference for me in my social work journey and so uh, we just we couldn't allow tonight to go without remembering him and I know that lots of you in the audience enjoyed the webinar that he was at and so we send our love and our sincere condolences to his family who know that we were going to do this tonight. So I am going to pass on now to Becky um, and Becky is going to really introduce tonight's session for you because tonight's session came about because of, um, well, because of Becky, really, because I always encourage the team to bring forward any ideas that they have for a webinar. And Becky bought this idea. So Becky, do you want to tell us a bit about the webinar tonight and why? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, it came about really because of professional curiosity. Um, I wrote something a little while ago called the Professional Curiosity Cake and um, just through, uh, throughout these Connect webinars, Siobhan's really encouraged us to ask why and push why. 
And so as a final year student, um, I just found that my curiosity was sparked one day when I was planning for my final placement. I'm a final year student in the child protection team and I was doing a bit of research about equality practice and safeguarding. And there was an opening chapter in my book that I was reading that was specifically about male practitioners. Um, but it surprised me in a way because the key words that sprang out were wariness, outright suspicion and caution. Um, they were the main kind of words that were being expressed about men in paid or voluntary work involving children. And that really sort of surprised me because I've had a fairly long career working in children's services and it's never really crossed my mind to think of any of those words when I've been thinking about the men that I'm working alongside. Um, but it just sparked curiosity, like I said, and, you know, and I, I just wanted to know where that came from, really, because I know a lot of brilliant men in social work. Um, I'm fortunate enough to know sort of at least three of the panel quite well, and I know what they're doing kind of in their daily practice, in their studies, and they're achieving great things and, you know, and they're teaching me things. So it's just, it was born out of that, really. Um, we had some really interesting conversations and we had some debates about this while we were exploring, exploring the content of this webinar. And they've really just increased my knowledge and, and that's how it came about really. So um, yeah, that's pretty much where it came from really, but because I asked why. <laughs> so um, that's enough for me. I don't like being in front of the camera. You don't often see me in front of the camera. So I'm going to get back behind the camera and I'm going to pass over to our first panelist who is Dwayne Phillips. Fabulous, thank you, Becky. So it's over to Dwayne, thank you. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I just want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, as you know, my name is Dwayne Phillips and I am a second year social work student at the University of Wolverhampton. Uh, I also work full time uh, for an adolescent support service as well. So today, just what I hope to do is just share some of my experiences and kind of some of my reflections on that as well. So um, whenever I talk about my route into social care, I always start by stating that I'm here by accident. Um, and one of my most prized possessions is my certificate for work experience. And uh, I got that in year 2000 and in year 10, uh, my head of year sent a really badly behaved Dwayne to a daycare setting run by a friend, which was opposite my school. And she was certain that I was gonna fail and that would have given her another excuse to exclude me. And I know this because years later, the manager of the nursery told me. So, uh, and, and honestly, I had the greatest two weeks of my life. I uh, felt like that I had some purpose. And in that moment, I couldn't believe people got paid to look after children. But after it ended, I went back to school, hated school and inevitably dropped out at 15 and got a job. So this certificate is all I left school with. Now, um, you know, when I was 16, I, luckily I went to college and started my journey into childcare. And after two years of becoming a straight distinction student, I got my first job at a day nursery working in a baby room. Now, I, I still remember the first day so vividly. I was really nervous. It was a proud moment because I felt like I'd actually done something, had something positive. The first parent comes in and I introduce myself and she immediately turned around faced the manager and said, I'm not leaving my baby with him. He could be a paedophile. So in that moment, you know, there was massive panic and I felt like I'd made a huge mistake and started wondering about what other careers could I do. But, you know, thankfully I continued on. And the, unfortunately, these experiences aren't what have been a feature throughout my career. So uh, I started then to think about where I fit in. And... Uh, as we know, men are a minority in social work. And I started to ask myself a few questions like, is it societal's view that it's women's work? Is that a reason why there's only 15% of males? But I also fit in another tiny box, uh, which is the mixed ethnicity for social workers, which is only 4%. But for myself, who is mixed white and Caribbean, it only actually makes up 1.3% of that box, about 340 social workers. So I also question if my ethnicity is a factor as well and not necessarily we you know we have to we have to recognize that black people and people of color are hugely overrepresented in social care so even though that 1.3 percent sounds tiny according to the census data 
white black Caribbean people actually only make up for 0.8% of the population and black people uh, account for 3.4% of the population in comparison to the 12% where they're represented in social work. Now also the uh, the census is up for uh, updating this year so it is a little bit uh, out of date. So although I know there's an overrepresentation of my ethnicity in social work sometimes I feel like uh, the odd one out and uh, when I pr proudly told people about two years ago that I've been successful in being accepted to start my social work degree, um, a social worker really passively said that once I qualify, I'll be fast tracked into management. Now, at the time, I did not understand this. I don't believe that I've ever really been given any advantages in my career. Um, but the social worker could have been correct. And I've been researching a term called the glass escalator, which Christine Williams uh, introduced about 20 years ago. And it describes the advantages men receive in women's professions, such as nursing, teaching and social work. So I could agree with this social worker in the moment. However, I don't believe this is the same experience for black people and people of color. So although the research has many limitations, there's been some research to suggest that black male nurses, for instance, don't get those same advantages of the glass escalator that white males do. And Wingfield said that for black men nurses, gendered racist images may have particular consequences for the relationships with women colleagues who view black men nurses through the lens of controlling images and gendered racist stereotypes that emphasize the danger they pose for women. Now that really stands out to me. And it also made me think, actually there is an overrepresentation of black people and people of color. So why is it not reflected at the top? But in my historical practice, I've, uh, I've had professionals feel reluctant um, with me working with maybe some mums, maybe some female teenagers. And they've also even made assumptions about maybe my ethnicity and appearance that that might match something that the, the family we're working with might be attracted to. I've had passive comments like, she's really gonna like you. Um, and these types of passive moments happen more than you think. And it can sometimes feel like a complete overlook of my qualifications and experience. And I also think these un unhelpful behaviours reinforce racial stereotypes. And in my early days of practice, I don't think I would have even challenged it. But as I reflected and kind of prepared for today, I started to ask myself, is there anything else about being a man in this industry that I'm conscious of? And the other area is union memberships. Now, I don't think I'd ever practice without being in a union. I think even with, you know, maybe feminist movements, which I support, such as maybe Me Too, that I worry that when we have terms such as believe all women, that that could even be a dangerous term for me practicing. If an allegation was made in respect for me, in respect to me, am I, even if I was found to be innocent, would I be guilty by public opinion? Now, it sounds irrational, but when I start to add up all the experience that I've had and other professionals that I speak to have had, it's a vulnerability that sits in the back of my mind. So um, the last thing I wanted to talk about was role models. Now, personally, I love being a role model. And as I started with, you know, I didn't expect to make it this far in life. I didn't even expect to get anywhere after school. So I sometimes feel like this is a ma massive stroke of luck. And being a role model for me is almost like an honest status that you can be identified as a person that can maybe be looked up to and can inspire others. And I find sometimes having relatable journeys with young people can be hugely empowering and motivating for others. However, Herd Zimmerman and Z said that having someone to look up to appears to be an asset for adolescents, but this asset can cannot be universal, universally be applicable to all adolescent outcomes. So, and I've seen this with other social workers, family support workers, and people in similar roles that even indeed myself being a person of colour can sometimes lead to maybe being, for me being allocated more young black ma males with the notion that they need a male role model or they need a black uh, male role model, which on the one hand is really important that marginalised groups of society see their identity in different roles, especially in these roles where we hold a lot of power. But, um, you know, sometimes I feel like it ignores maybe the socioeconomic problems that having we have in society and it doesn't recognize maybe philosophies such as critical race theory. 
Now, last year, Wayne Reed wrote about racist practice, anti-racist practice in social work, and he was clear that his opinion couldn't represent all black uh, and minority and ethnic people with, when he stated that we're not a hom homogenous group. And I feel like that as well. We're not a homogenous group. And, um, you know, just because we might look similar, our experience of being black isn't just, it isn't just about skin colour. Sometimes it's about the environment that we're in and what, you know, challenges we've been individually faced. Now, whilst I love being, you know, that role model, um, it's been identified as similar effect in other, in other roles, such as teaching, where being a role model can be negative. And uh, there were, Simpson said that teachers also feel resentment, male teachers, sorry, that they were often given more difficult classes. So whilst I, need, whilst I personally love being a role model, we need to maybe think about the term and consider if it undermines some of the amazing women that I work with day to day, who are just as capable as I am. And we should ask ourselves if we use the same terminology for, will we use the same term, terminology for a young male that had two female parents? And how many practice, practitioners and managers are allocating work to female practitioners with girls saying that they need a female role model? Like I said, I love the title, but I wouldn't be a social work student if I wasn't critically analysing everything. Um, so I'd like to firstly thank everyone for giving up their time and I'd like to hand over to the next pre next presenter. Thanks for that, Dwayne. That was really interesting, fascinating. And I know you've put the references together for people and I know we're going to get all of those references out to people that have attended in the follow-up email that Kat will send out. I'm just thinking, I can't see the chat and the questions, but I imagine that there are lots of points being made in the chat and probably lots of questions but I'm thinking because we've got so many speakers we'll look at questions at the end if that's okay Dwayne, Dwayne. so we may well come back to you with those questions but I think what was fascinating there was you bringing in that intersectionality of being a man and also being a black man and the issues of that and the the diversity of experience I think was fascinating and I also love the way you concluded by saying you wouldn't be a social work student without critically analysing yeah. it all would you and I think you did that brilliantly and you've got PCF domain nine ticked off by me there for that mm -hmm. you know loads of feedback we've got loads of practice educators in the audience who'll give you feedback if you need it on your PCF domain nine so thank you for that thank very you. much Wayne. we're going to go to our next speaker now and Joel is going, well, Joel will introduce himself, really, I think, but Joel is going to tell us um, a bit about his experience as a man working in social work in Wales as well. So, can I hand over to you now, Joel? Are you yeah. there? Hi, everyone. You okay? Thank you um, so much for coming today. Um, so, I kind of was invited to just talk a little bit about my kind of experiences of being a man in a very female-dominated world. Um, which is social work and kind of chuck in a little bit about the Welsh context because how we practice in Wales is a little bit different to how our colleagues practice across the UK. So um, a little bit about me um, and my academic and professional experiences. So I did a BA honours in education, psychology and counselling. This was very female led. Um, we had no male teaching staff. We had no um, male kind of lecturers or experiences to kind of refer to. Again, that was a very female-led um, experience for me. I then went on to do a master's in social work and I was two, I was one of two of the white males and the only gay male in the cohort. And again, very, very female-led. Um, the academic teaching staff were all female and we never again had that experiences of understanding what a man's view was in social work. Uh, when I went on to my placements, again, I was the only man in all of the teams. I, um, in my first placement, I was the only man. And again, in my statutory placement the second year, I was the only man again. Um, when I became qualified, I started as a duty social worker. I still am a duty social worker in Cardiff Children's Services. Again, the, the whole provision of my service is female led. When I started, I was the only male. Um, all of the managers within the duty teams are females, all of the operational managers are females, all of the um, top, top dogs of our like organisation are females. So coming in as a newly qualified male in an all-female team, I was very, very anxious and very scared. Um, and, you know, a little bit of positivity, I now have three, three males in my team um, in Cardiff, and that's just my duty team. So there's three of us now. Um, which is fantastic because we're able to share how we feel 
after visits or when we're having to have difficult conversations with, for instance, teenage girls or, um, you know, teenage lads. And it's really good to, to feed back and reflect. I'm a committee member for Baswell and I'm soon to do my PhD at the University of Bristol. Um, and I'm honoured to be supervised by two inspirational social work leaders and they are ladies. And, you know, for a man to be in um, this, this field, I have to say I'm honoured to stand next to our female counterparts because without them, we wouldn't be able to learn. And without us, I don't think they'd be able to learn either. Um, and there's just a few of my little passions there at the bottom. But if we, if we go on to the next slide, um, I'm going to talk about the demographics in Wales. So in 2017, as you can see, in Wales, we had the ratio of four to one. So that was four females to one male in the profession. And again, that's kind of stayed the same through 2019 and 2020. But the differences between 2019 and 2020 is that in 2019, there was 5,114 women registered with Social Care Wales, and there was 1,149 men registered with Social Care Wales. And then in 2020, that dropped by 34 men. So 34 men left our profession last year. Now that doesn't seem a lot, but when you look at the, the kind of difference between men and women, that's absolutely substantial that we are losing men to our profession and we are, you know, continuing to be an even more kind of um, minority within our profession. Um, so they're kind of how it's looking in Wales at the moment. And like I said, there's now three men in my team and I love, I love it because it really does make me feel great to be a man in social work and, and you know be proud of being a man in social work. So what I'm going to look at next is gender question and how that impacts on relationships. So we as social workers are a helping profession and historically women have been recognised as less worth than males. So women as though have always had it harder, women have always been paid less, women have always had you know real difficult times when um, working especially on the front line so in regards to kind of how then we fit in, we as a profession are systemically devalued because of the history that attaches to our profession. So like I said, we're a helping profession led by women, but women in this society are always seem to be less important than men, which is absolutely not the case. That in regards to the demographics in Wales, we are, you know, led by women constantly, people, some people that I've worked with have never ever had a male social worker, so they never know how to react when they see me at the door. But when they do see me at the door, they have, you know, already there's a stigma attached to me. Now, Dwayne touched upon it slightly, but um, when I've gone into practice and when I've turned up at homes or when I've gone unannounced, people look at me and say, well, you're a man, you're not coming in here. You know, you might be, you might be a DV perp. You know, you're not talking to my kids because you might be a paedophile. That's absolutely not the case. And a lot of that oppression comes from the organisation. It comes from how people view the local authority. They view the local authority or they view social workers as all women, we, you know, an all women led uh, organisation. So when a man rocks up, we've already got that stigma, we're already oppressed and we're over, we've already got that barrier to break down. So when we're questioning our gender, we're questioning the balances and the, the power of gender, we're then worried about our relationships and how that impacts on our profession or our engagements with families. And a lot of men tend to be passed aside or you can work with the teenage lads because you're a man and they need, they need a man in their life or, or you can't have a, um, a female genital mutilation um, family because you're a man and you're not going to understand that. But ultimately, we're all practitioners and we're all the same. We're all the same when we've got our social work hat on. Um, so it's just a little bit about being mindful of whatever we are, we are a social worker and we, we all act and, and respond in the best interests of that family, regardless of whether we're a male or a female. So what I'm going to talk about now is quickly about the Welsh context. So in Wales, we're all governed by obviously the Children's Act. Now in Wales, we have a different legislation called the Social Services and Wellbeing Wales Act. Now that was introduced in 2014 and really kind of collaborates on four main principles. Now that talks about collaboration and collaboration in Wales is about the stronger partnerships um, between organisations to enable and encourage people to achieve their best outcomes. Earlier interventions within this act looks at promoting the use of preventative approaches with 
um, children, families and citizens of Wales to really, really get to kind of what it is that they're worried about. So wellbeing, again, pretty simple, talks about supporting people to achieve their own wellbeing and measuring their success and ensuring that they measure their success and how people, which is an underpinning um, principle of the Wellbeing Act, putting that individual need at the centre of the care and support that they get from the local authority. And how we do it in Wales, Wales is a very diverse and very um, kind of um, devolved nation. We have come so, so far from when we were attached to central government. Wales is um, diverse in respect of affluence, poverty, oppression and um, academia, if you like. So up in the valleys, how social workers practice in the valleys is completely different to how I practice in the city of Cardiff. It's completely different to how Becky practices in her local authority on placement because Becky is from Wales. Um, so in regards to the Welsh context, when we're practicing and when we're intervening with the family, we are going in on that individualized needs. Our practice is adapted to fit that individual individualised needs, their strengths, their trauma, and we enable wellbeing regardless of that background and systems. However, one of the things that's difficult for men in social work is trying to adapt that Welsh context when we're having to intervene, when we're having to kind of go and knock on that door and already face that stigma, already have that oppression, and coming from a local authority that already is systemically oppressive, we're having more things to contend with. But that kind of goes back to the history. What I'm trying to cover here is how in Wales we have to um, use our skills and our observational skills to change the way we interact, um, to, ch to meet the demographic of where we're practicing and where we're, you know, to meet the demands and needs of that service. But what I want to kind of pull apart here is that I'm a man in a very, very female dominated profession, but I am so proud of being a part of that profession, to be surrounded by all of these incredible women that I work alongside, you know. Being a man in a female dominated world is an honour for me and they are leaders. They lead me and I lead them and I've worked so hard to get where I am today and it's not because I'm a man, it's not because I'm going to be given that golden ticket to get to the top because that's not what I want because I love social work just as much as my female colleagues love social work and it's our profession and it's what we stand for, isn't it? So I just want to say, be proud of being a man, be proud of being a woman, be proud of who you are, but most of all, be proud of being a social worker and let's collaborate and encourage men to be a part of this phenomenal and just beautiful profession that is called social work. So thank you all for listening and I hope you've had a little whistle-stop tour of being a man in wheels. <laughs> Thank you, Joel. That was a lovely message to end on. Be proud of who you are and be proud of our profession, I think is a fabulous um, message there. Thank you for that. And I can see there's questions popping up um, for each speaker as you speak. So you might want to engage in the chat and join in with that. But thank you very much for that. We're going to go to our next speaker. I've um, known Jamie actually since he was a student and um, Jamie is actually, Jamie, I noticed earlier you and I were quoted, I think, uh, I spotted you were quoted, I think, in the um, first slides by Dwayne. I'm sure that uh, was the case. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna, I'm going to hand over to you now, Jamie, if that's okay. Okay, thanks, Siobhan. Uh, I think that's the first time I've ever been quoted, so that's very kind of you, Dwayne. I'm Jamie Brocky. I'm a lecturer in social work at Staffordshire University. Uh, and like other colleagues uh, this evening, I'm going to take quite a reflective approach. I'm not going to give a lecture as such, but try and relate some of my reflections from my experience when I was a student and then just going gently through my career and then try and link some of the some theoretical concepts and some research to try and expand on on some of the thoughts that I've had about my career in social worker in, in social work rather so um thinking about where I was when I, I started training um like um colleagues um I was quite apprehensive about it very similar fears about working with children in particular I was very lucky and fortunate in the um, before I was training, I'd, I was working in children's services in an administrative role. So I'd seen male social workers in action. I kind of had 
um, you know, a clear idea that, you know, this is something, um, you know, a career that is, is you know, accessible uh, to men and, and men were, the men on the team that I was working were, were very popular as were, as were the women as well. And I thought, well, you know, I could give this a go as well. This might be the kind of career for me. I like um, talking to the service users on the phone, at meetings, I thought, oh, I'll give this a go. So that was really my, my motivation, some role models, a uh, bit of experience of working with people. But I do agree that there are a lot of uh, reservations going into training. Um, not least the, the concern about how you'll be perceived by other people, whether that's sort of members of your family or what, what they think about going into a career that's, that's traditionally um, uh, mainly occupied by women. What will um, members of the public or other people on, on the course that I'm going to join, what are they going to think about a man joining? Um, in, in my own experience of that, a lot of my fears were, were misplaced. I think we have to be fair to ourselves that we're, we're products of our social environment. So it's, you know, we, we see cases, uh, we hear stories in the media and from colleagues uh, that lead us to sometimes think that actually, you know, um, you can be scapegoated or, or accused of something you haven't done. These, these labels of being a perpetrator or a threat to children can, can stay with you. But actually, my own experience, even though I didn't go into to working with uh, children and families as my career, my career was in adult services. And it was um, very much the case when I was working with children that I actually got quite a warm reception. I didn't ever get the perception that I was unwelcome or wanted, unwanted. In fact, actually, I think um, people were very uh, welcoming to me as, as a social worker uh, working with, with children. And, and latterly with adults. So I think sometimes we can um, have these preconceived ideas, but actually in the real world, when we push ourselves outside of our comfort zone, we can actually find that when, when we're working with whoever, whether it's adults or children, that actually some of these, uh, these fears subside and we get engaged in, in practice and focus on, on what our real uh, mission is, which is, is to support people. So in terms of um, the, the opportunities that I, I've sort of had as, as a male social worker, I'll certainly say that whilst, um, you know, I think that I've always offered a lot to, to the teams that I've worked on, I do feel that um, from my own perception that actually um, I have had quite a lot of opportunities that perhaps um, I couldn't say hand on heart that have been afforded uh, to everybody that I've worked with. And I think gender sometimes does play a role in that. So in terms of the, sort of the research that, that I've looked at, actually, um, sometimes uh, ma male workers do get um, privileged for opportunities and training and CPD, um, and sometimes for a number of factors, sometimes female colleagues don't always feel that they get the same uh, treatment. So in terms of my career, I did uh, have access to a lot of, of training. I completed additional qualifications in, in best interest assessment and practice education, and went into management quite quickly. So I think there is definitely something in that, in the case that actually uh, there is um, some benefit to being uh, a man in social work. So I don't think we can, we can take that away um, uh, from, from, from what the research says. And some interesting research we're a little bit old now, but from Moriarty uh, and Murray, that's quite useful in uh, sort of giving an overview of some of the experiences uh, of men in social work. And certainly there's a lot of uh, crossover from the research, from my own experience. So um, social work uh, is perceived uh, as being a feminine profession and sometimes offers poor pay compared to other professions that might be uh, more attractive uh, to men. And then and the research from Moriarty, where he does sort of uh, reinforce my own experience, this fear of, of being a threat to children or having your, your motives questioned is quite a powerful disincentive to, to men going into social work. So I think uh, there's, there's definitely uh, some, some reassurance there that some of the, the concerns that some of us had early on are supported by the research. It's not just us, but I think uh, there's a lot 
uh, in the research that, that supports that. Um, one of the other concerns is that men going into social work, indeed engaging it, can be quite worried about being perceived as being feminine. Uh, and I think um, that is um, you know, a concern of a lot of people. One of the reasons why sometimes social workers uh, or people thinking about going to social work can be put off. I think, you know, it remains to be seen whether that will change uh, as time goes by and as we have sort of different and broader uh, conceptualizations of what of what gender is. Um, and that brings me on to, to my next uh, point, really. Uh, as, as social workers, we should challenge uh, these, some of these conceptions around gender. There's a lot of debate in the research about what gender actually is and where some of these ideas come from. Uh, and as social workers, with our, our critical hats on, we should be, be questioning these. There's some good uh, research, getting a little bit old now, from, from Cossins, who wrote, writes quite eloquently about some of these ideas and really explores uh, an, this idea of hegemonic uh, masculinity, this idea that there's an uh, archetype of, of being a man and that actually, um, you know, anything less than being sort of athletic and um, and successful makes you sort of a sort of lesser man on, on, on the scale of, of masculinity. And as social workers, we were tra trained in this tradition of being quite critical of ideas like that. And so sort of, I think um, certainly social work education has, has a role to play in sort of dispelling some of these myths. So there's definitely a role, uh, I think, uh, for, for academics going forward in continuing to help students to explore uh, the relationship between gender and power and the diversity of male experience. We know that not all the men we work with uh, hold a lot of power. Many men actually feel quite disempowered, particularly when they're working with, with social workers, uh, whether they're experiencing poor health and well-being or their, their parenting skills are being, being challenged. So we need to recognise there's a wide breadth of, of, uh, of experience uh, amongst uh, men in society. We wouldn't, shouldn't always assume that all men uh, think or act or behave or, or feel in similar ways. I also think social work education has got a role to play in increasing awareness around diversity uh, and, in, and giving students the, the skills to, um, particularly male students, giving those skills and building on those skills uh, around empathy um, and, and supporting people uh, through really difficult times in their lives. And finally, as I think of nearly out of time, practitioners in positions of power really need to make sure that they afford opportunities based on equality. So where we are in positions where we can give training opportunities or uh, job roles or promotions to people, we need to be mindful that we're not thinking, or oh, you know, the male on the team is going to be the better manager or they're going to be better uh, in a more specialised technical role or perhaps a more um, you know, high flying academic. Actually, it should be on merit and we need to be critical uh, about when we're thinking about how um, people's gender um, affects their ability to, to do their job and, and to really uh, seize the opportunities that are given to them. OK, thank you very much for listening. I was still muted then I was chatting away I could see the chat has been really busy so I know there's lots of people got uh, really interested in what you're saying and I think as each speaker is speaking people are seeing lots of connections between things and themes in their own studies and learning so um, I think you'll be very welcomed back into the chat to join in with the conversation there so thank you for that um, and we're going to go to our next guest now. Um, so we've, um, I think it was Kelly said at the beginning, we've got a whole range of, well, actually, if we include um, our own David, our own panellist, um, regular team member, new team member, we've actually got men from the whole of the UK, representing the whole of the UK. David represents Scotland. We've had Joel earlier representing Wales. We're going to go now to Dylan, who is joining us from Northern Ireland. So Dylan, um, are you able to switch your microphone on for us? Yeah. Can you hear me Fabulous. okay? Absolutely. Thank you, Dylan. It's all over to you now. 
Thank you. Um, well, it's great to be on here and see so many people engaged in this very important issue. Uh, and it's fantastic. I saw in the chat earlier about how many um, social work students and colleagues representing from Northern Ireland, which is absolutely fantastic to see. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about men's social work and preconditioned ideology. Uh, I'm really speaking from personal experience um, as well. So this is my social work journey um, right from secondary school um, through to getting my social work degree and further on to my master's. Um, as a, a, young, a young boy, I knew that I wanted to um, be in a helping profession. So I really wanted to become a firefighter. Um, I wanted to be this macho man and, you know, I saw Fireman Sam and that was always my idol. Uh, and that really grew and I went down this avenue between going towards the teaching route or going in social work and I chose social work. Um, one of the pinnacle moments in my career um, was I volunteered at Childline uh, and that was really the, the deciding factor um, for me. I also work in the United States running a summer camp for children and adults with developmental disabilities. And that's a great passion of mine and I'm hoping to have my dissertation published on inappropriate sexual behaviour um, with regards to that. Um, so if we can move on to the, the next slide and I'll begin. Um, so I'm actually practising at the minute as a school social worker, which is very unusual uh, in terms of placements and settings for social workers. Um, this is a model that both my colleague Shania Tolan, have to give her a shout out, um, and I both developed. Um, it's nothing new, it's actually in 50 other countries and it looks at embedding social work practice into places of school to really provide holistic support um, for children and young people. Um, and this model goes into the different elements of that from assisting the safeguarding team with child protection issues, um, working with our care experienced pupils, um, and we call them our, our CAPI gang, which are fantastic group of young people, um, looking at mental health, um, support strategies for the wider school community, parent, people, and school engagement, and um, bespoke interventions within the, the school environment. Um, United Kingdom and Ireland um, still do not interweave this professional practice into our education system. However, I am aware that uh, across the water in England, um, and I believe in Wales, um, they are now trialling social, school social workers, which is absolutely fantastic to see. Um, and it's really wonderful to see so many student social workers now getting placements in school. Um, I think it's really innovative and it's the way to go. On the next slide. So yes, I wanted to discuss um, gender and being a man in social work and I'm a very visual learner. Um, so I came up with this kind of pendulum idea and the reason for that was um, I had the unique um, experience of having a, a social worker assessing me for fostering as a single male carer. Uh, that was a really insightful and opened my eyes to the underlying oppression and, and views of males, really, um, particularly even those within the profession of social work. And um, so this, I created this pendulum, um, if you will, and on one side you'll see safety and expectation, and on the other side you'll see apprehension and appreciation. So typically um, in any childcare, particularly with the professionals, um, females tend to lie between the safety and expectation. And the reason for that is um, drawing from personal experience, when I attended the skills to foster training um, as a potential single male foster care, um, a lot of the risks were mitigated by having a female presence. So things like bathing a child was seen as a very risky activity. Um, however, if there was a female present, the risk level significantly reduced, similar to um, driving or transporting a young person. Um, again, if the female was present, you the risk dramatically reduced. So there is this element of safety associated with being a woman and again the apprehension of a, of a male but equally so when we look at the appreciation and expectation um, parts of the model um, you will see that the female lies between the expectation and safety because uh, if we're looking at a practice example uh, if a child or young person is having um, a tough day or is, is upset or there's a crisis situation and a male responds, it's like, oh, wasn't Dylan absolutely fantastic with that young person today? Um, he's so caring and he really puts everything at the heart of what he does as these young people. However, there's an expectation almost that females will automatically do that and that appreciation is actually removed. And that all boils down to these preconditioned 
um, ideas that we have placed upon females and males in terms of qualities. Um, the fundamentalist qualities based upon gender, such as like caring, nurturing and compassionate are all attributes typically associated with females. Um, and such qualities, including like, again, caring and building relationships um, and emotional labor inherent in social work as well, are still very much placed on, well, that is an expectation for our female colleagues. Um, but as I said before, we as men cross this line between very, very um, blended line between appreciation and apprehension and suspicion. So again, I could be appreciated for going and helping a young person and the build up the trust there. But yet if it's a, a young female, for example, and they want to disclose something to me, it's like how many of, of other male social workers being told, now make sure that you bring somebody else into the room, you know, in case she makes an allegation against you. Um, but, and I understand obviously there is that element of providing safe practice and safe working. But if it's not applied to our female counterparts, then why is it applied to males? As a profession, you must ask yourself, are we also embedded into this fabric of society of presuming that males are suspicious, are we are apprehensive about allowing them to practice in social work? Um, again, the, the normative masculinity also determines that men must remain emotionally distanced while avoiding female qualities, which is why we see so little men in social work um, and Duane and, and Joel touched on that um, so wonderfully. Um, interestingly though, there is strong statistical evidence and this is a study done by Christie, um, highlighting the disproportionate um, representation of men at managerial levels, as well as the tendency for male social workers to be employed in more masculine, as she put it, um, areas um, such as probation because it's more involved with control rather than care. Um, and then on to the, the next slide. So interestingly, when we actually look at the model again for um, the individual being an, an adolescent male, the pendulum sways very much for a man in practice towards expectation. And I know that both um, Joel and Dwayne touched on this um, male role model, um, which is very much an assumption placed upon male practitioners that if we have a an adolescent male presenting with challenges or has had um, an adverse childhood experience and, and a rough background, um, for lack of a better phrase, that we automatically assume that placing a man with them is going to sort that problem out. And again, that is, I've seen that in practice in social work, but also in education. Um, so if we are having that expectation of males to work with adolescent males, then what are the barriers for them working with younger children? Well, why are we so apprehensive about allowing them to work with younger children, even as a profession. We we'll talk about the language of liberty and it's great to see so many students on tonight. Um, you know, you're the future generation of social workers uh, and you have all the insights and knowledge. And this is something that as a profession, we must start challenging and changing the narrative that men are suspicious, our men are associated with higher risks um, and also challenging that if we as men are expected to work with adolescent males, then why can we not work with adolescent females? And why can we not work with younger children? Um, because at the end of the day, we all sign up to our professional codes of practice. We are all held accountable by those. They're our moral compass. So if somebody wasn't adhering um, to our standards and our codes of practice and our values, then as a professional and a duty of care, we should report that anyway. So we shouldn't assume, you know, we should be assessing and assessing and trusting our colleagues and male counterparts to work with um, young people. And overall, the research emphasizes, and I've spoken to many young people about this, you know, um, in the school environment, I work with um, adolescent females, and I've said, you know, would you prefer, um, Sinead is also my colleague, would you prefer Sinead to come and talk to you about this? And the young people are always saying, no, because all we want is consistency. We want a sense of care. We want commitment. Um, and workers and these qualities are embedded within social work practice. So regardless of gender, young people don't, half the time don't really care if it's a male or female, but as professionals and as adults, we're placing this um, thought process upon them. You know, she, she won't want to talk to you because you're a man. Without actually hearing the child's voice, at the end of the day, it's all about relationship-based social work. Um, and then on to the next. Yeah, as I, as I mentioned before, the apprehension and appreciation and safety and expectation. Um, and you can see there the split again when it goes towards 
um, the child being a female or male or female younger younger child and you might wonder and question the little dots across um, and yes it is a pendulum so they do represent the the model swaying however they also represent that gender is a spectrum it's fluid so when you look at this model um, and as practitioners and as student social workers it's really important to reflect so when we look at this model reflect on where do we see a male gay social worker where do we see a, a female lesbian social worker where do we see somebody that is gender neutral so we need to start asking ourselves these questions and also asking am i enabling this process of men being made to feel suspicious am i enabling this process of um having to put further expectations on men to work with adolescent males and as a profession we're fantastic at reflecting you know there's been plenty of assignments i'm sure that you've all done on reflection and we need to start reflecting on these minor and major details of where do we actually stand as a profession where and looking at this model can i see where i actually am being oppressive unconsciously um, you know, because when I, again, referring back to my experience on the skills to foster training, I did challenge it um, as social justice is part of social work. And I'd say, say, you know, it made me feel very much uncomfortable. Um, but I want us all to look at where are we and where do we place ourselves on this model, but also where do our values place others and our stances and our opinions? Um, so under the, I think that's it, yeah. So that, thank you very much for listening. I know it was very brief um, and I wanted to link into the other guys' presentations as well. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you, Dylan. That was a fabulous presentation. I can see from the chat, it's uh, people again, very interested in what you're doing. And I'm sure that actually in the future, if you'd be willing to, we'd love you to come back and talk about school social work actually, because I think that would be a topic for itself in a webinar in a few months time so thank you so much Dylan for doing that I know as a practice educator I've really enjoyed working with students in schools I think there's such a lot that we could do as a profession within the school setting so thank you so much for that and um, I am so pleased that actually all of our speakers have been so brilliant at sticking to time that things are going really well and we're going to hand over now to our final speaker of uh, this evening and um, I'm going to ask you to switch on your microphone Jason and you can introduce yourself and your slides are up now. Cheers thanks for that Siobhan uh, my name is Jason Schaub I'm an academic at the University of Birmingham um, and uh, my research has focused on the experience of men both as uh, student social workers and then uh, later on when they qualify and go into practice. Um, so I'll be talking about the research findings that I have and what's really good for me to, uh, to see is without having any knowledge of what the previous speakers have been talking about, they've already stolen most of my thunder, which is great. It means that they're um, all over this stuff and it means that I'm, well, frankly, that I know, I'm, I'm connecting to the things that they're talking about, so that's helpful. These are a couple of things I'm gonna talk about, the context of where this situates, what the research questions were for my for my study, um, uh, what the methods were that I used, the findings, and then uh, offer you some opportunity for questions for everybody as a, as a group. So just a bit of context, my studies have been situated specifically in England. There are um, uh, a couple of studies that are ongoing now that are um, UK wide, but there are 95,000 social workers registered in England. And that just gives us an idea about the numbers that we're talking about. There, um, some of the other speakers have mentioned about the fact that social work is identified as, as uh, women majority and uh, has been called women's work. And that's a term that um, other scholars have applied to it. This is not me saying that I think it's women's work. I need to be really clear about that. And that's because um, in those circumstances about the associations between social work tasks and caring and femininity. And that, that caring and femininity is identified as, as almost exclusively um, feminine and that men are unable or unwilling to express that. And that social work is included with other caring professions, which include primarily teaching and nursing. And there's an awful lot of crossover between the experiences um, of those three helping professions um, with some specific examples because, or specific differences because they have uh, different presentations. Okay. So the, the next little bit that I want to be talking about is the fact that whilst the situation is challenging, 
uh, for the proportion of men in social work, it is going to get worse. So I, I hate to say that at the end of an evening, but I'm afraid that that is the, the situation as it is. The proportion of, of men to women has got, been going down since the 80s, and it was about 15% in the early 2000s. Um, and, it, and the numbers and proportion of men coming into social work programs has remained slightly under 15%. But the reason it's gonna go down in the profession as a whole is because we have a significant proportion of men that are near retiring age, that as they retire, the proportion of the social work profession generally is going to go down. Um, and that means that um, there have been some policymakers who have seen that as a concern, so such as the Scottish Funding Council, leading us as in many other things, um, has identified that social work as well as other um, professions, because the pro proportion is less than 25%, specifically need support to, um, to improve that proportion. So at this point, it, I think it's helpful just to spend a couple of minutes or, or, or a couple of seconds really thinking about why would we want to increase the number of men? Because that isn't necessarily a fait accompli. We shouldn't just rush towards this and say, well, if the proportion of men is low, well, we need to increase that because balance is good. That, that's not necessarily, it's a, not a foregone conclusion. And the three models, most of which have already been mentioned so far tonight, are using men as role models, improving the professional status and prestige of social work, and to improve the gender diversity of the profession. Now, the first one of those, the using men as role models for service users, has been not completely debunked, but it has been significantly critiqued and actually found not to have much basis in, in actuality. That children and young people are able to identify a range of, of gender roles from people, from, uh, from women specifically, but also from across that. So they don't necessarily need a man role model in order to develop um, masculinity um, identities. Um, improving the professional status and prestige is a problematic argument to make because um, I, I, I noticed that David Galley is in here and I just want to say hi to David Galley. He identified that young husband was the first person who suggested that um, in introducing men is going to um, um, ratchet up the professional status of the, of the profession. And what that says is that um, women aren't able to do it on their own and they, they need men to help them. And that really isn't a, a stance or, or a presentation that works in a, in a gender equal um, uh, society and in, and in modern Western society. The last argument I think has the most um, sort of uh, currency currently, which is to improve gender diversity. And that relates to um, the sort of wider diversity uh, um, questions, similar to what Duane was talking about, the fact that the um, profession should reflect the people that it works with. And it works with children and, and adults that are both men and women. And so as a result, just like um, ethnic diversity, the, the profession should reflect a, a broader range of diversity. Okay, so looking at some of the pieces that have been in the press, um, there has been a series of repeated calls um, about why are there so many, why are there not very many men? How do we improve the number of men? Um, there was uh, a concern about um, written in a professional social work about women that were reigning in social work. Um, and again, David Galley, who is also, I've seen him somewhere in here, wrote a piece for The Guardian about why are there so few male social workers. And I think these questions are repeatedly asked, and that was what led me to my own study about why there are so many, why there are so few men and why there are challenges. And moving on to the next slide, one of the other uh, speakers, um, again, stole my thunder about the glass escalator, but that is a really key element within this because most of my research has looked at men in social work education, so male social work students, but when uh, the challenges that they experience there don't completely disappear, so I wouldn't want to suggest that the men's experience that have talked so eloquently so far tonight um, are, are inaccurate, but instead those are balanced by the fact that they actually rise through the ranks towards um, management and other positions of power like academia more quickly, and I accept Duane's point that that is um, complicated by issues of ethnicity, and I would also suggest issues of disability and, and other forms of protected characteristics are a part of it. But the glass escalator is a really significant issue for men specifically to be thinking about when they enter the profession and how comfortable they are about moving through those ranks when the proportion is so low, so around 15%, that there's, a, that there's actually a numerical majority that they hold in positions of power. So it was just recently that the number of professors in social work that were women outnumbered the number of men that were professors in social work. And that wasn't the, the proportion within the profession. 
Okay, so looking at the, pro the progression on social work courses, and I wanna be really clear that what I'm presenting here is knowledge generally drawn from across both um, education and social work literature, and it doesn't replicate everyone's experience directly. So there's oftentimes that people's um, experience would relate differently to this. But essentially in education in, uh, in the UK and, and predominantly in the United States as well, and the rest of North America, men do not progress as well as women in education. And that's across primary, secondary, and higher education. Also, men are generally more disengaged from university courses when we identify what we mean by disengagement. And that means that they attend class less often, they may be less willing to take up roles and a whole range of other forms of disengagement. Um, at university, men are less likely to identify academic problems and they are less inclined to seek help to address them. So this brings up the adage of, um, if, if I'm lost and I'm driving my car, I'm less likely than a woman to stop and ask for directions. This is before the time of Google. So everybody who's too young to remember time before Google pretend that there was such a thing as no phones. Um, and, that, and in this circumstance, the reason that this is an issue is because women, uh, women students are more likely to be able to identify when they have an issue. And then they're more likely in addition to that to then go and seek help about it. Um, specifically around social work, so looking, moving from the general to the specific, men have worse progression on, than women on social work courses, and my own and other researchers' work has identified this repeatedly. This is even when we manage for some of the um, uh, diversity issues that have been mentioned already so far this evening around ethnicity, disability, and age, they're still more likely to um, have, have issues around uh, failing, withdrawing, and other things. And interestingly about that, um, women are less likely to leave a course where they are in a significant minority than where men are more likely to leave in a course where they're a, a minority. Okay, so these are some of the stats that I, I drew up. They're 15% more likely to defer, which means that they're going to take a break and, and want to come back to something. They're 47% more likely to withdraw, and they're 60% more likely to fail than women. So that's the number of men who start their, pro their program and the number of men who complete their program and how long it takes them to do that in, in between. And again, that's when it's managing for all of those other variables in there. So these are the research questions I looked at. Essentially, why is that the case? So not just we know what it is, but why is that happening? And if men's experiences can help us understand that. So um, the methods, nobody but me is interested in the methods. I'm desperately excited about them. But essentially, I talked to a load of guys from a number of different universities that were had a broad age range um, that broadly represented the sort of student group, okay? The findings that I came up with are represented by what I think is probably my proudest moment and across my entire life was to be able to generate this, um, this graphic um, and, and I'm inordinately proud of it. So it goes into every presentation, even if it's not about men in social work. But the one that we want to pay attention to here is the attractive sort of beige uh, sort of portion of that, which is the specific, the challenges for men. And these are specific challenges just for men, not challenges for all students, which is the part underneath of that, which is that the course might be difficult or that they have problems with time management and other things like that. But instead that men were seen as not welcome in social work, which has been identified already, that men are not natural social workers, that they feel silenced on the program, they feel they need to self-protect and that there are elements of disengagement. And I've just got a few more slides that talk about um, some, of the, some of the quotes that I had from the participants that I had, and they were incredibly generous with their time and very open with their experiences, which I found very moving when I was talking to them. So Yusuf was a 25-year-old was a man on an undergraduate program, and he said this uh, around uh, why men are not welcome in social work. He, he said, I can see why men might feel as though, you know what, I'm in the wrong profession. From the very beginning, they feel that they're not welcome into the profession. And maybe that's why there are low numbers and why some people drop out, because they think they're surrounded by a lecture theater full of women. A lot of lecturers are women, and they're only talking about women's issues. Now, again, I want to make sure that this is um, one of the participants' quotes, and it slightly relates to what has already been spoken about by some of the um, speakers already this evening. Another um, participant talked about how men are not natural social workers, and Joey reflected on the fact that it's a bit of a daunting thought if I got placed with children and families, and I tried to give support around parenting. It's a double-edged sword. Well, you're a man and a gay man. What do you know? I don't think I can do that. That concerns me a little bit. And he was really anxious about going into um, children and families social work and having to comment on someone else's parenting. And just to be clear, all of the men's names in this have been changed, so these are pseudonyms. These experiences and challenges are exacerbated by traditional gender roles, which has already been brought up earlier. 
And Owen described this as, if you hear about stuff going on, things like kids getting abused, it's more to do with men, really like things like Jimmy Savile, which for those of you that are international was a very famous case of a, of a celebrity um, for decades abusing children and adults, um, famous people taking advantage of kids and stuff. Yeah, you don't hear of any women doing that sort of thing. People are going to be more suspicious of you. Okay, and moving on. So generally participants felt that women were better social workers because of an assumed natural affinity between women, femininity, caring and social work world role. And that meant that they felt that there was a barrier that they needed to work to get over so that they could reach the same sort of standard that women were able to do. And they felt that that was um, also reflected upon them uh, by the people around them. And so the places that the sites that increase men's um, anxiety are things such as interaction with children, which has already been identified uh, earlier this evening, situations talking about domestic abuse and discussions um, about gender and men's power. And that that's around the gendered boundary for participants and that they're associated with women and femininity. And that um, the, the pendulum that Dylan identified was I thought a brilliant um, way of sort of considering this as a way to think about the boundaries and the ways that the, um, the spectrum is quite porous between those. In particular, I do want to spend the last couple of minutes about thinking about the placement as a site of anxiety. The placements in particular for social work students were identified as a real particular concern. This has been found by other people's research, Parker and Crabtree at Bournemouth, and participants um, in my study said that that was the same thing because of their concerns around working with children and women. And that was most particularly because of potential allegations about working with children, but also around concerns around being sexually um, inappropriate with people. So these are some of the things that um, I would suggest can help based upon the participants. So mandatory tutorials, and that's because voluntary tutorials mean that a, um, uh, a student doesn't have to take it up, which means that a man might not be willing to engage in that. Support specifically for men about direct practice and challenges, because even if there's only one man in that cohort of 60, which I saw somebody had put into the chat earlier, then that one man is gonna have difficulties on placement that the women around him are not gonna have and probably um, needs to be discussed. A consideration of those topics that increase men's isolation, such as domestic abuse, and to be aware of the fact that um, some men in those circumstances can feel as if they're being identified as trying to speak for all men generally. And of course, any man in the student group isn't able to do that. And lastly, early individual and targeted support for men that seem to be struggling. And so identifying to the men that they might be struggling and suggesting to them to come in rather than waiting, because we have quite a passive sort of higher education system where we ask, where we wait for the student to tell us that they're having some difficulty. Um, and then the last, um, I want to leave on a slightly positive note because I'm still a social worker, even though I've worked in university for over a decade. Um, and one of my participants said this, it's been a baptism of fire. It's such a vast area. I find it impossible to master any aspect of it. But he was so excited about the opportunity, he couldn't wait to get to get going. That's it from me. Um, it, my contact details are somewhere else on the slides. And if you've got questions about this sort of stuff, I would be delighted to answer them. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for taking us through that research that you did really, really quickly, but really well. I, I captured all of it, even though you were galloping at some points. But I think what was brilliant there was what we try and do in these webinars is bring together theory and practice. And for me, what tonight's webinar has done, and I think has kind of been brought to a climax almost at the end with that, is that bringing together of theory, research with practice experiences, with ideas and suggestions from practitioners for models that could be utilized. And I think that's been a brilliant blend really of everything that we need in social work. So thank you very much for that. I know that there are loads of questions. I know Kat normally manages the questions for us. Um, I know we're gonna go on to some questions, but we've literally got only minutes really for questions because we know our numbers always go down from now because people have to get off and get tea made or do whatever it is that they're having to do if they haven't already had the tea. Um, so we'll be very quick with questions. But what we will try and do is we will be sending out everybody's resources to you in the next couple of days. And we will try and make sure that we get questions that were specific for people um, through Oh, lost <clears throat> Shall I go to the questions? I'm lost, am I? Oh, you're back. Back, sorry. Internet connection unstable. It's just there we go. Okay. 
So uh, we'll try and get questions out as well if we can do, because we can't get all of the questions answered. But um, here we go. Oh, Jason's already answering. So does I can see that. Anyway, I can see Jason's answering. OK, so. Um, uh, Rick one for Joel. There's what area is his PhD in? Um, so my PhD is in uh, social work, but it primarily focuses on relationships between children, young people and their families within an intake and assessment team. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are, I think there's some questions that came earlier that I think have been answered as the sessions have gone on, but I can see um, there's a question here. Are there certain service user groups that men wouldn't feel able to uh, work with from a risk stroke ethical perspective? I don't know um, if anybody wants to answer that, if any of the panel would like to answer that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so in respect of kind of my job, I'm a duty social worker, so I am expected to work across the spectrum on any kind of thing that comes through the door. Now, recently I had a really amazing experience with a young girl. She is at substantial risk of CSE. You know, she is being substantially abused by criminal organisations in Cardiff, and it's absolutely horrific. So... Initially, I was a little bit anxious because she's a girl, you know, she identifies quite poorly with men. She doesn't really have great relationships with men. She doesn't identify the risk that risky individuals pose to her. Well, she um, unfortunately became pregnant very recently. And the first person that she called was me. She came out of the hospital and she called me and she said, Joel, I don't know who else to call, but I need to speak to you. And for me, that was just absolute reassurance that no matter who you are and what you do social work is phenomenal and just because I'm a man doesn't mean I could you know I didn't provide anything different than my female counterparts now there's certain things that I do worry about there's certain things that I do feel a little bit awkward a little bit sometimes when I'm speaking to females especially young teenagers about um sex or about their relationships um, and DV as well with young people, because that's quite rife in Cardiff at the moment. Um, and sometimes I feel a little bit anxious, but I need to remember I'm a social worker first and then I'm a man. You know, I'm a social worker first and then I can, do, I can be Joel. And I have to remember that and I have to take myself back a little bit and go, right, Joel, stop. You're a social worker first. Get over it. But because of the prejudice and because of the stigmatisation that men are faced with, we instantly think, oh, we can't do this because it's not going to look good. It, we, we can't say that because we're a man and we, we're going to be deemed as this perpetrator. So it's just about being mindful and remembering that first you're a social worker and then, you know, your gender comes second. So again, about gender questioning and how that impacts on your relationships. I suppose that also fits into what Dylan was saying about how Dylan will give young people a choice and really what young people are interested in is relationships, commitment, Absolutely. listening, not gender, really. Mm. Um, okay. I'm not sure that we actually have time for any other questions. If I'm, uh, I'm sorry about that. What, what are your thoughts, Becky? I know. Um, yeah, I think that's about it now. I think we're close I, to. Yeah, I think so because we do ordinarily try and finish at this point but um what we will do is try and get um in our follow-up email we'll try and get as much information to you as possible from all the panelists and um, what i would say is all of the panelists are on social media i think and uh probably busy engaging with that as well as having been engaging in the chat as well as jason's been answering some of the questions again. oh gone again okay uh, I need one of you to do this a bit then. No, Siobhan, Siobhan, you're there. I we think, can hear I think Becky's Perhaps. gone. Okay, we can I hear thought you. I'd gone again. Okay, if you can hear me, that's fine. Okay, so apologies for any technical issues towards the end. At least it was at the end. Our uh, next, our forthcoming webinars are up on the screen at the moment. The team will be putting the links into the chat, ready for you to register for webinars across the next couple of weeks um, it would be fabulous to see you again and um, we hope that you haven't just turned up for one session and you're not going to come to future sessions our uh, webinars are different every week but always interesting to social workers I would like to say a huge thank you 
from the team to all of our guests tonight. Thank you to Dwayne, to Joel, to Jamie, to Dylan and to Jason. I think tonight was a brilliant session. I think you brought such a lot to it in the flavour that we want Social Work Connect uh, webinars to be. Thank you so much uh, for that. And also a very special thanks to Becky, who had professional curiosity and uh, set up this webinar. Fabulous. Thank you so much to everybody and good night. <laughs>